Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Noel. Welcome to the channel and thank you for stopping by. Backpacking. It is a super easy way to be able to travel for cheap and prioritize experiences over spending a ton of money. I have been backpacking through dozens of countries over the span of many years. I absolutely love it. I'm a total advocate for it. And I've learned a lot along the way in terms of just general travel advice. So I'm going to share that travel advice with you today. This is actually part two of the video. For the sake of time, I don't want to make these videos too long. So I cut them up into parts one and part two. So in part one, I give you five tips plus a bonus tip. In part two, I'm going to give you the exact same thing. Five tips plus a bonus tip at the end. So make sure you stick around for that bonus tip at the end. If you missed part one, no problem. I'll leave a link to that video at the end of this video. The advice that I'm giving is in no particular order. So you don't necessarily have to watch part one before you watch part two. So let's get to it. The first tip I have for this video is about luggage lockers at major international airports. These are super convenient if you want to schedule a long layover in another country so that during your layover you can go out and tour that country as well. The luggage lockers allow you to store your baggage safely at the airport so that you don't have to carry it around as you're roaming around the city. So for example, a few years back, I went to Morocco with one of my best friends. And on my way back from Morocco, I scheduled a long layover in Spain. So I was able to store my bags in the luggage locker that was located in an international airport in Madrid. And that enabled me to be able to go out and explore a ton of places in Madrid without having to carry my backpack with me. If you want to plan for a long layover in a city so that you can leave your stuff in the luggage lockers there and go explore the city, you want to be able to do some research before you actually make it to that city to ensure that one, they do actually have luggage lockers, but then also where those lockers are located. It's helpful if you write this information down on your itinerary or keep it somewhere actually physically written down because if you get to that location and you don't have Wi-Fi service or you don't have any ability to be able to look on the internet to try to do the research at that point to find where the luggage lockers are located, if you have pre-planned to store your stuff there, then you already know which terminal the luggage lockers are located in so you can go there. I will say about luggage lockers, they're basically always going to be located outside of the terminal. So you're going to have to leave the secure area and when you come back, and pick up your bags, you're going to have to go through security again. So make sure that you plan in terms of timing for getting through that security line. Second piece of advice, international driver's permits. If you're planning on renting a car in a foreign country, you want to do some research beforehand to see whether or not that country is going to require you to have an international driver's permit. Now, if you live in America, these are super easy to get. I usually always go to AAA to get mine. You can get it on AAA.com, if you have some leeway time, you just fill out the application form online. It costs $20, you submit it, and they'll mail you back your international driver's permit. If you're crunched for time, you can go into a brick and mortar AAA shop and they can do it on site. These international driver's permits are good in over 150 countries and they last for 12 months. I'm not sure how many people actually know about international driver's permits. I only learned about it because I was in a situation where I was driving in a country and all I had was my US driver's license and I got pulled over at a checkpoint and I didn't have my international driver's permit and I got fined for it. So I learned my lesson from that and on that Morocco trip that I mentioned before, I got an international driver's permit before I went on that trip and again when I was driving in Morocco, I got pulled over at a checkpoint but I was able to present my international driver's permit and I was let go, no problem at all. Another thing, if you're going to be driving in a foreign country, you're going to want to have car insurance. Most U.S. policies don't have international driving as a standard provision of their plan, so it might be something that you have to add on. But in a lot of countries, it is illegal to drive without insurance. The third piece of advice involves staying connected with your friends and family back home while you're abroad. Nowadays, so long as you have internet access, staying connected with your friends and families should not be a limiting factor for you or something that you really need to worry about all that much. If you're going on a short trip, my advice would be to turn your phone on airplane mode, which will ensure that you're not being charged data overseas. U.S. international calling plans are ridiculously priced. It is a major gripe for me because there is absolutely no reason why it costs so much to make an international phone call in the United States. Other countries do it so much cheaper. 
I literally cannot think of a reason why it is so expensive. You do not have to pay for that. I never have, and I'm gonna tell you how to get around it. If you have Apple products, so if you have an iPhone and the person that you're trying to connect with has an iPhone 2 or maybe an iPad even, then you can still connect with each other using iMessage and FaceTime. FaceTime doesn't have to be a video call. You can do FaceTime audio too, and that's one way to be able to make calls essentially for free because all you're using is the internet. And if you're connecting to the Wi-Fi and turning your cellular data off, then you're not gonna have to pay for it and neither is the person who you're calling. If you don't have an Apple product, or even if you do, but you're having trouble using iMessage or FaceTime, or you're trying to connect with somebody who does not have an Apple product, there are other applications that you can use like WhatsApp, that's the main one that I use, where it still allows you to have texting capabilities and also make phone calls all using internet connection. So again, you're not being charged for the text or the calls and neither is the person that you're contacting. Now let's say that you wanna call a business. If the business has a toll-free number, like a 1-800 number, then if you call them via Skype, that call is gonna be free. But what if you wanna call a business that doesn't have a toll-free number? For that, I usually just end up using Skype. Skype calling credits are pretty cheap. Even $5 can get you a very long way in terms of actual minutes that you can talk. If you're gonna end up staying in the country for longer, so I'm talking like a matter of months, then you might want to look into getting an actual phone number in that country, even if it's just so that you can contact emergency services if you need. Each country differs with how they establish calling plans. I've been in countries where I've had to sign contracts to be able to get an international SIM card, but then I've also been in countries where I can just go to a convenience store, buy a SIM card, I don't have to sign a contract at all. So it really all just depends, but if you are going to live in a country that requires you to sign a contract to be able to get a local phone number, just be aware that that contract might be in the country's language. So. For instance, when I was living in Kyrgyzstan, I remember signing the contract, but the contract was all in Russian. So keep that in mind. If you're the type of person who usually does read the contract, like, like me, then, well, you might have trouble. The fourth piece of advice I have for you is a pretty invaluable one if we're talking long term, and that is keeping a journal of some sort. Now, I'll admit, I am absolutely horrible when it comes to keeping up with journals. But when I am traveling, I do at least make a concerted effort to try to sit down every evening just for 20 minutes at least and jot down my impressions from the day. So I'm talking what you did during the day, any experiences that stuck out to you, any type of interaction that might have changed your perspective on something, things like that. I guarantee you, if you think that you are gonna write these things down when you get home, you are probably not gonna write these things down when you get home. But more so, you are going to forget the details a lot more quickly than you think. So keep a journal. And you don't have to do like a paper and pen type of journal. Honestly, I don't do that because that's just even more work for me to keep up with. I use an app called Day One Journal. I like Day One Journal because it's quicker for me to type than it is for me to write. Also, Day One Journal has the ability to sync across all of my different devices. So even if I'm out on the go and I need to jot something down on my cell phone, I can still do that and then come home and elaborate on those thoughts using my iPad. However you wanna do it, it really doesn't matter. Bottom line, just get it done. Keep a journal. You will regret not having kept a journal for years to come. Big piece of advice, in-country transportation. Let's say that you're planning your trip and you want to be able to visit different parts of the country that are not geographically close to each other. How do you get around? The first place that I look when I'm trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B is a website called Rome to Rio. They also have an app that you can download for your phone or your tablet. Rome to Rio allows you to input your origin city and your destination city, and they'll pull up all of the different modes of transportation that are available to you so that you can pick whichever one is best for you. They'll also include the estimated amount of money that it's gonna cost you to travel by each mode of transportation. So for instance, how much it's gonna cost you in gas to travel by car or how much a train ticket is gonna be. But what's convenient about the website is that they usually provide the official links to the places where you would need to make the reservations. So I'm talking like the bus station or the train station. So that way, directly through the website or the app, you can link to the official website where you can make your own reservations. 
If you're traveling to two locations that are very far apart, then consider using domestic airports. That's an option for you too. Otherwise, you can travel by train or car, but it's just gonna take you a lot longer. Though, if you travel by train or by car, you'll be able to see a lot more of the countryside. And the last thing that I'll say about transportation, if when you're planning your trip, you realize that you wanna travel to a bunch of different cities in the country, and you're starting your trip, at one end of the country, but you're ending it at a separate end of the country, you can always plan your trip so that you're flying into one international airport, but then flying out from another international airport. It's an easy adjustment to make while you're doing your booking. Just make sure you look for that option. And so finally, I promised you a bonus tip and here it is. Just say yes. Unless it is something that is truly an absolute no-go because of a high risk of death or loss of eyesight or limb, just say yes. If it's something that pushes you outside of your comfort zone or something that you would have never thought to do yourself, then say yes. Some of my most amazing travel memories have come from doing exactly that, just blindly saying yes to something that I otherwise would probably not have done on my own. Now, mind you, some of my worst travel memories have come from doing the exact same thing, so there's always gonna be a bit of a gamble there. But no matter what, however that ends up going for you, you're still going to have an amazing memory of this crazy thing that you did when you visited this unforgettable place. So say yes. Like I said at the beginning, this video is part two. I will leave a link in the description box below to part one, and I'll also leave a link in a card above my head. If you like this video or learn something new, please make sure to hit that like button down below. That's how I'm able to tell that people are actually getting something from this content. Also, I post new videos every week, so please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below too, so that way you won't miss my next uploads. Thanks for stopping by and I'll see ya.